good afternoon everyone and at the very outset i would like to express my heartfelt thanks to the organizer for inviting me in this august gathering so my uh, topic today is echocardiographic evaluation of the atrial septal defect so my disclaimer is i have taken uh the reference from the american society of echocardiography society of the cardiac angiography and intervention and also from the journal of american society of echocardiography august 2015 issue so our aim today is uh, to know about the interatrial septum by transthoracic transesophageal echocardiography and also by eyes identify the parameters to characterize interatrial septum and its abnormalities like patent foramen of the atrial septal aneurysm atrial septal defect and advantages of the eco modalities which are currently available and clinical and prognostic significance of uh, these defects and especially the evaluation of the atrial septal defect during transcatheter device closure so i'll give importance uh, to this section because i am an interventional cardiologist and then we will see how to do the follow up with these modalities so what is asd we know that it is an atrial communication in the picture we are seeing which is uh, about 6 to 10% of all the heart disease and 30 to 40% of all the shunt anomalies and you know that patent foramen ability which is also a septal abnormality is present among 25% of the normal population and asd and patent foramen ability is a significant health problem for the pediatric adult cardiology medicine neurology and surgery professionals so if we want to know the atrial septum and the septal defects we should know what are the contributors of this septum so this atrial septum you know it is contributed by septum primum septum secundum and atrioventricular uh, canal septum which is derived from the endocardial portion so to know about asd we have to know which part derived from where so here is a picture you are seeing uh, that two parts blue part is usually coming from the uh, septum prime uh, septum secundum and the red part which is inside is coming from the uh, septum secundum so this is a picture here is the video you can see from this video uh, how to how to understand about the asd from its developmental uh, point of view so so this is the uh, so this is the asd here and then you will see how the septum primum sorry it's, it's not coming so i can show you here also that this is the septum uh, primum and this one is the septum primum and this is the septum secundum and this is the se uh, ostium secundum from where asd second degree or asd secundum usually arise and this one septum secundum patent foramen ovale usually remain on this side so this is the patent foramen ovale which is on the right atrial side and this is a communication and uh, actually when left atrial pressure rise uh, it become evident in many of the normal populations so patent foramen ovale it is not a true defect but a potential space between the septum primum and the septum secundum and its incidence is uh, i have mentioned already is about 27% average and this is the patent foramen ovale in a model and by echo you can see like this so it is a tunnel like potential space which is evident when left atrial pressure is high and then this is the septum secundum type ostium secundum type and this is a deficiency in the septum primum so this is very important this is a deficiency in the septum primum which is usually on the uh, left atrial side and the size of this defect may be round may be elliptical and we can see this from the echocardiography so here is the video we are seeing that this is the pulmonary artery and this is the atrial septal defect with the left to right shunt from the left atrium which is evident by the presence of the pulmonary veins and then this is uh, the classification of the uh, septum second, secundum type of asds 
there may be complete absence here. So this is a common atrium. It is like a circular or an elliptical or oval shaped. Uh, and it may be a fenestrated type with multiple ASD if there is uh, only fenestration in the septum primum. And this is the ostium primum, which is the endocardial cushion defect, which we have mentioned in the developmental part. So this is part derived from the endocardial cushion. And here you are seeing that this is the ostium primum. And sometimes this kind of defect is associated with the whole endocardial cushion defect, which is an AV canal type of defect. Then is the sinus venosus type. And sinus venosus type is not actually a true ASD. In this case, there is partial or complete absence of the sinus venosus septum, which lies between the uh, uh, superior vena cava and between the pulmonary vein, right upper or middle pulmonary vein. So here in the picture, you are seeing that this is the superior vena cava and pulmonary vein and the ASD is in between. And then another variety is the unroofed coronary sinus. The wall of the coronary sinus is absent within the left atrium or it may be deficient. You are seeing here is a dilated coronary sinus. And uh, this is the defect. Here also you are seeing that there is a defect with the left atrium and there is absence of the roof of the coronary sinus. So this is known as unroofed. But if it is associated with the persistence of the left-sided superior vena cava, then we call it Raghiv syndrome. Another type of abnormality is the atrial septal aneurysm or ASA. This ASA, it is actually the remnant of the valve of the inferior vena cava, which directs the blood in the fetal life towards the patent foramen obli, but sometimes it persists. And what is this important? It may be associated with the patent foramen obli, it may be associated with the cryptogenic stroke in adult population and some other embolic events. And estrogen valve, it is also very important. Sometimes it remains and then it also causes like uh, uh, stroke and cryptogenic stroke in the adult population. So you are seeing here the picture of the estrogen valve, which is the remnant of the inferior vena cava. So what are the parameters which need to be evaluated for the atrial septal defect? We have to see uh, whether there is a presence or absence of ASD, and then we have to look for the size and shape of the defect. Then we have to assess the rims in case of second term ASD to see the suitability for the device closure. Then we have to see the degree of direction, degree and direction of the shunt, whether it is a left to right shunt or right to left shunt due to pulmonary hypertension, or is there any change in the chamber or is there any remodeling in the chamber? We know that there is right-sided volume uh, enlargement in this kind of cases. And there is pulmonary hypertension also. So our duty and responsibility is to met, measure the pulmonary artery pressure and to see the um, volume overload of the right-sided uh, chambers. So with what tools we evaluate these things? We evaluate by transthoracic esophageal echocardiography, which the photo we are seeing here. And then also with the help of transesophageal echocardiography and with the help of intracardiac. Transesophageal and intracardiac, the image quality is almost similar, but the thing is that here the probe is inside the esophagus and here the probe is directly, you are seeing the probe inside the right atrium and it is very close proximity to the atrial septum. And here actually no general anesthesia or uh, uh, is required because the probe is just like a catheter introduced like, uh, like a catheter. So what, uh, what are the uh, actually modalities? If the patient is in the pediatric population and weight is less than 35 kg, in that case, for diagnostic purpose, we can use transthoracic. For the procedural purpose, we can use transthoracic and transesophageal. If the window is poor and for the follow-up, we use transthoracic. But if the weight is more than 40 kg, in those cases, sometimes transesophageal help is required because the eco windows are not so good in many of the cases. And for the adult population, in most of them, window is poor. So in all three types, like for the diagnosis, for the procedure, and for the follow-up, especially for these two diagnoses and tra transcatheter procedure, transesophageal is mainly preferred by the people who are doing these cases and transthoracic lastly for the follow-up. So uh, I will discuss mainly about the device closure procedure in this regard. So echocardiography is mainly helpful for the selection of the patient for procedural guidance. 
for the assessment of the device efficacy to check the complications afterward and also for the follow-up definitely. So by the tense trans thoracic, as I have mentioned in our setup, we have limitation of manpower, we have many restrictions. So mainly we give importance to the trans thoracic and trans thoracic, you know, we can uh, take multiple planes and trans thoracic offer multiple unlimited planes. You can repeat it anytime you can do it bedside or anywhere uh, you want to do it. So there is a lot of advantage of the th trans thoracic and if you um, have good window, then trans thoracic is enough to complete the whole procedure. About the trans esophageal, uh, it is actually real time, highly detailed imaging of the intradental septum. Even if uh, you want to see the catheter, the device, everything is clearly visible with this modality, but the th this modality needs conscious sedation, especially general anesthesia in children. So there is chance of aspiration and it is an invasive procedure. Now the, the two dimensional T uh, can be enhanced, more enhanced by three dimensional imaging. And the, this is helpful for evaluation of the IAS anatomy, then visualization of the wire catheter devices and their relationship with the adjacent structure, which is very important. So T is superior than trans thoracic, of course, but it is not always required. Then ice, ice image quality, I have mentioned already that it is like that of the TEE, but it is uh, actually uh, more comfortable to the user because it is like a catheter. But the thing is that it is very expensive, single time use, and you have to throw it after using in a single patient and uh, cost of one is like $7,000. About the transcranial Doppler, you know about the transcranial Doppler. This is a good modality for diagnosing patent for amenability, especially in the cases where the PFO is missed in trans thoracic echo, even in trans esophageal echo. So in those cases, transcranial Doppler can be done where we place the, uh, actually the Doppler over the carotid artery in the neck, and then we can uh, uh, take the help of the valsalva maneuver. And then we can see the patent for amen ovale. And even if we fail to see the patent for amen ovale by this method, we can actually go for the uh, bubble test also. So we can introduce some of the bubble through the anticubital vein and we can see them. Uh, I'll show you. So there are many studies of transcranial Doppler uh, which is very much sensitive and very much specific for detecting patent for amenability, especially in the cases of stroke, cryptogenic stroke. So uh, we use actually the uh, spectral Doppler and uh, bubble introduced through the anticubital vein appeared in this envelope and more than 10 bubble in a single envelope or uh, in a single uh, like section is indicative of the presence of patent for amenability. So you are seeing from uh, this picture. So what is the role of trans thoracic in the procedural guidance? So in the procedural guidance, mainly we take sub uh, views and the four chamber views and the parasternal short axis view. And from these views, actually, we can see the relation of the device with that of the roof of the right at uh, atrium, with the right pulmonary vein, with the superior and inferior vena cava, with the AV valves, and also with the pulmonary vein. And if we take the help of the trans esophageal echocardiography from the basal transverse, transverse four chamber, short axis bicable and long axis view, we can see the device relationship with that of the atrial roof. And then with the aortic valve, atrioventricular valve, then with the posterior wall of the atrium, then with the right, right atrial and left atrial roof. So all these things we can see from the trans esophageal. So in summary, we can evaluate the HD type, then we can see presence or absence of the patent for amenobili. We can see the Doppler flow, direction of the shunt. We can see the chamber dimension. We can see whether there is any stretch and bulb or theory network. And we can actually measure the circular index, whether the HD is a circular one or a oval one or an elliptical one. So circular index we can measure, I'll show you later. And of course, we can do the REAM evaluation, then dynamic nature of the ASD, whether there is too much difference of the ASD dimension in systole and diastole, which is very difficult uh, in case of selecting the device specially. So you have to take little bit large size device in those cases. So this is one of the uh, patient we are seeing here from our cath lab. And you are seeing, we are measuring the REAMs here, and this is the shunt direction. 
and this is the reams, the one AV ream. Uh, this is the actually anterior inferior rim. And then this is the superior rim. And then we can, uh, as I have mentioned already, we can detect the shunt, left to right shunt. Actually, uh, we do by the color Doppler and color scale, 25 to 40 meter per second is good because these are low velocity city jet. And bidirectional shunt, we can detect by actually color flow and by the uh, uh, PW Doppler. PW Doppler is good for the low velocity jet. And we can also calculate QP and QS because there are some software now. So we can calculate QPQS pulmonary vascular resistance from the machine. So this is uh, again another one uh, from our cat lab. We are showing uh, here the reams and the size. One minute. Of the RTC. Okay. And then here we have already implanted the device. So the rim estimation is actually the most important part if someone wants to do the device closer. If the rim is less than five millimeter, then we call it deficient. And if it is less than one millimeter, then it is absent. So there are various rims, aortic rim, you know, it is the anterior superior rim between the atrial septum and the aortic valve. Aortic valve rim, it is between the atrial septum and the AV valve. And SBC rim, it is, between, it is the posterior superior rim between the ASD and the superior vena cava. And IBC rim is between the SD and the inferior vena cava. Posterior rim is the posterior wall of the atrium. And right upper pulmonary vein is between the SD and the right upper pulmonary vein. So if you remember this picture, this is the round figure. And this is also the round figure. So this is the anterior side. This is the superior. This is the inferior. And this is the posterior. So in the anterior side, anterior superior part is the aortic rim. Anterior inferior is the AV valve. Then uh, directly inferior is the IBC, posterior is the posterior wall, and superior rim here is the SBC rim and right upper pulmonary vein rim. So we can measure this rim as time is short. I'm uh, not showing you all this. Uh, so these are the actual measurement of various rims, which I have mentioned. So having adequate superior, inferior, and anterior rim is crucial for successful device closure. And for the shape determination, you can do the circular index. You can divide the uh, uh, diameter and length. And if it is less than 1.5, it is circular uh, or round ASD. And if it is more than 1.5, it is oval ASD. So these are the hardware which are used for the device closure. You can see them very clearly in PEE and eyes. So indication is actually the large ASD and small ASD with chance of paradoxical embolism. So these are the various devices we use and we do balloon sizing in uh, all our places actually because by doing balloon size, we can see, select the device as minimum size as possible. So how it is possible? So you are seeing here that waste is appeared in the balloon. So we can select the size of the device equal to that of this balloon waste, which will give you a minimum size device. So these are the hardware just to show you and with the help of the echocardiography, we can see all these hardwares very nicely. And we can assess all the stage of the device procedure very nicely. And here we are doing the balloon sizing in the sizing plate. And with the echocardiography, actually, we see the stop flow. When we inflate this balloon here, we see the stop flow. If there is stop flow, then we stop inflation of the balloon. So in the procedure of the device closer, in all steps, in all steps, we take, take the help of the echocardiography, either transthoracic or transesophageal. For the children, we take the help of the transthoracic. And for the adult, sometimes we take the help of the transesophageal. But in most of our cases, uh, we are so used with the transthoracic that we are actually comfortably transthoracic in most of the cases. So these are the fluoroscopic and angiographic uh, views. And this, this view is the short axis view, which is very important in device closure. If you see the uh, both disc of the device like this, on both sides of the aorta in short axis view, we'll be very happy that the device is in nice position and there will be no chance of embolization. And this is one of the PFO last uh, month from our cath lab. The patient is 22 years, presented with cryptogenic stroke. And then we found that there is a PFO. And then after knowing that, we close this with this PFO. And you know that PFO device is different from that of the ASD device. 
left atrial disc actually is small here than that of the right atrial disc. And these are the complications which can also be evaluated by the echocardiography. So one is the cardiac perforation where there will be pericardial effusion and tamponade. There may be device embolization. There may be bleeding, pulmonary embolism, device erosion at the aortic side. And this may need to go for the surgery. There may be infective endocarditis in the sep in the device and there may be device fracture also. So all these can be evaluated. And in the follow-up, we can do transthoracic before discharge next day. And then transthoracic one week after discharge, we should do the ECG to look for the heart block arrhythmia and conduction abnormality at the same time. And we should keep the patient in follow-up for at one, six and 12 months. And then yearly thereafter for as long as you need to do it. So this is the transthoracic next day of the procedure. And after that, seeing this device in the position, we discharge our patient. In our center, our selection criteria is by transthoracic. And then we use minimalistic approach for the device closer. And then we usually do not use T unless the window is very poor. So in conclusion, transthoracic echocardiography is the least invasive modality for percutaneous closer. T provide detailed imaging, ICE is alternative to T and transesophageal, and regardless of the imaging type, PM assessment is mandatory. Balloon sizing is recommended before all procedure and stop flow technique is very good. And careful imaging guide is mandatory at all stage of the device placement. Transthoracic echo should be performed before discharge and should be repeated at one week because many complications may happen within first week. And follow up at one, six, 12 months and yearly thereafter for up to minimum three years and then as and when required. So thank you everyone and happy new year 2022. Thank you.